You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories, the podcast where we bring you the story behind the stories and the storyteller. Author interviews, writing advice, book reviews, all sorts of great stuff. If you are a book lover, Author Stories is the place for you. We have more than 550 author interviews in our archives at hankgarner.com. Please go over there and check it out. Also, check out our YouTube channel uh, where we also have all of the episodes archived there. If you don't find an author interview that you're looking for on the website, click on the archives tab. There's a long list of them where you can click and download and listen uh, right there. I'd like to tell you about some sponsors that make the show possible. The Locust, books one to three by Ralph Kern. The complete Locust series, an epic tale of mystery, survival, exploration, intrigue. The cruise ship MS Atlantica is lost on these strange and uncharted seas where even the compass shows the sun rising to the west. Atlantica's passengers must do what it takes to survive. The three books, Unfathomed, Expedition, and Osiris. Atlantica arrives in a strange new world, unable to locate land and with no way to contact home. They must find new allies, fend off relentless enemies, and discover the horrifying truth behind the Locust. The Locust box set contains all three action-packed novels in this best-selling science book. Unfathomed, Expedition, and Osiris, acclaimed for great characters, thrilling action, technical accuracy, and a compelling sense of mystery. Buy it today from Ralph Kern. The Locust. The Renegade Star series, books one through three from J.N. Cheney. Jace Hughes is a renegade. That means taking almost any job that comes his way, no matter the situation. So long as he can keep his ship floating, he's free to live the life he wants. But that all changes when he meets Abigail Pryor, a nun looking for safe passage out of the system. Too bad there's something off about the cargo she's carrying. Jace knows he shouldn't ask too many questions, but when odd sounds start coming from inside the large metal box, he can't help but check it out. Big mistake. The Renegade Star box that includes the first three books in the series, 900 plus pages, 300 plus five star reviews. Find out why people are so intrigued by this thrilling science fiction epic. You won't believe the twists and turns this series takes or the secrets that get revealed. The Renegade Star series, get the entire box set on Amazon or audiobook from audible.com there's links to it in the show notes well thanks for joining me again for the author stories podcast where i bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers today i'm really excited to have jill santapolo back on the show with us she was uh, on the show last year at episode 422 talking about her book the light we lost and uh, she has a brand new book called more than words out now and uh, we're excited to talk about it uh, welcome to the show jill Thank you so much for having me back. Well, I'm excited to have you back. So you've you've had a pretty busy year um, since last year. What's been going on? I've been writing a new book. I've been writing more <laughs> than words, um, which has been a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, so the um, the previous book, The Light We Lost, was your your first foray uh, into adult fiction, uh, kind of truly adult fiction. Um, how, how has that transition been for you and uh, has it been uh, as fulfilling as you hoped? It's been really wonderful. You know, I love writing kids books and I still do love going into schools and talking about them because kids are great and they have hilarious and really smart observations about stories (laughs) and about writing and they have great ideas. And when I go into schools, I always do these brainstorming story events with the kids and they come up with with really, really great stuff. But, you know, with The Light We Lost, I realized that the same kind of thing happens, not in the same way, obviously. Um, But I get 
Instagram messages and Twitter messages and Facebook messages and emails all the time from readers all over the world, really, who've read um, The Light We Lost and wanted to tell me you know, how much they enjoyed it or that it reminded them of a situation that they went through or, um, you know, that that it made them think about something differently. And it's really, really, really rewarding and, and really wonderful to sort of feel that connection with readers, which is the same way I was feeling that connection with kids in um, at school visits. So... I was worried that I was going to miss that, that reader author sort of, you know, bond. Right. Um, but, but I'm, I'm getting it in a totally different way and it's, it's equally as wonderful. Well, the, um, your, your books for kids, I know your sparkle spa series is hugely popular and, um, resonates with readers in a, in a certain particular way. Uh, and your adult fiction, um, you know, the light we lost, uh, is a deeply, emotionally resonant book. Um, when, when you sit down to write kids for kids or for adults, um, are your intentions uh, different? Do you, do you hope to to strike a certain chord with each? And does, does each genre or audience afford you certain things creatively that the other just can't do? That's such a great question. Um, so I think, you know, I think when I write for children – or for adults, what I'm trying to do is put myself in that world. So when I'm writing The Sparkle Spa, where the oldest character is 11, I I sort of try and put myself in the world of an 11-year-old. So any concerns that an 11-year-old wouldn't have are not in the book. So, you know, things like having children or, (laughs) you know, whether or not your boyfriend will or won't propose, you know, those are just, they're not there in the sparkle spa because it's not, it's not really what, what is, was worrying to an 11 year old. Um, So what's really nice about writing for adults is I can use sort of all experiences and of my life and everything that I've thought about to pull material from. Whereas for the Sparkle Spa, sort of, it's, it's that cap at, at age 11. Um, and I think I do, I do very much sort of try and keep in mind the emotional maturity of a eight, nine, 10, 11 year old when I'm writing those books. But then also understanding that when I write adult books, I can go there much more in emotion because ideally, you know, adults who are reading those books are, are more emotionally mature than they were at 11. Right. Well, you know, on, on the surface, you think, well, well, of course, if you're writing for kids or adults, it's it's two completely different things. And, and one is going to uh, more naturally be, be serious. One is going to be more, you know, age appropriate and uh, to an adult maybe come up silly or, you know, whatever the, the initial reaction is. But, um, but I, I think you can't just dismiss children's fiction that easily um, as, as something that's not lasting or um, something not, um, you know, resonant with people because there are lots of kid series that I read as a kid that still I hang on to today. Like they, they meant something very deep to me then um, that, that now, of course, uh, you know, from my <coughs> mid forties, um, you know, look to be very, um, you know, immature or whatever. But, you know, when, when you're writing to that age appropriate audience, um, mm. th- the same kind of care uh, goes into those books, doesn't it? Absolutely. And I think, you know, there, there are a lot of really, really beautiful children's books and really emotionally deep children's books um, that are out there. I mean, I remember growing up, Bridge Terabithia and Jacob Have I Loved, you know, were two of my favorite books in fifth or sixth grade. And, you know, they're, they're about the death of a friend. They're about, you know, the competition and jealousy between siblings and, and the complicated relationships within a family. So I think that there are, you know, absolutely deep and emotional 
books that you can write for children. But I think, you know, it's it's that same thought of what are what, what could an 11 year old be dealing with and how do they sort of internalize these experiences? I mean, Sparkle Spot is, is a little lighter and, and intentionally written at a little bit lighter. Um, but, you know, there are still issues that they deal with in in the Sparkle Spot, too, you know. Right. Competition between siblings and friends and, you know, somebody breaking their arm or getting sick or just, you know, things that, that you have to handle um, that life throws your way when you're 11. Right. Um, when you when you wrote The Light We Lost, um, were you – I know you've talked about getting, you know, feedback from readers all around the world. Um, were you surprised that, that this book um, uh, really connected with, with so many people? Well, I was floored. I, <laughs> I always say, like, this is the craziest thing that ever happened in my whole life, that that people in, you know, Romania and France and – India and Mexico and Spain are and Italy are are all emailing me. Norway. I mean, I get I get these incredible messages from all over the world, and it kind of blows me away every time. I mean, especially because when I wrote the light we lost, I wrote it from such a personal place. I was I was sort of writing it from my own feelings after going through a breakup. So the fact that this this intimate feeling was so resonant was was amazing i mean it's incredible and and it it just really made makes me realize how similar everybody is no matter what country you live in what language you speak what your experience is like growing up everyone has experienced love and loss in some kind of way and i think because of that reading about some who's experienced it just kind of is, is a big nectar. It strikes a chord. Right. Um, when you're reading that first um, book for adults, it, it's kind of like you're a debut author all over again, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Nobody knew who knew who I was. <laughs> right. Well, and, and, you know, what comes with that is no one expects anything from you and uh, because they don't know who you are. And uh, here's Jill writing um, this new book for adults and um, it, it'll probably be great. Uh, that's awesome. Um, but, but no one, no one knows that. Well, now that you've had a success like that and now you're, you're following up with your new book more than words. Um, what's the pressure like uh, in following up that first big success? I mean, there there is definitely pressure. Mostly, I think that I've put on myself that I don't want to disappoint all those readers because you know so many people who've sent me these notes have said at the end like I can't wait to read your next book, and I'm like, oh gosh, I hope they like it. Um, I just I just don't want to disappoint anyone. So, what was the what was the motivation uh, for the new book? How did the uh, how did the story come to you? When when you have an idea for a book, um, does mm-hmm. it come to you usually as as a character or as a a setting, a, a plot situation? How does it usually come to you? Well, so this one came to me because so my father passed away about four years ago, and after he had passed away, and you know I was sitting with my two sisters and my mom one of his friends came up to me and said to me, I think you're going to write about this one day. And to be honest, at the time I was, I was kind of livid because I was like, how, how could I ever write about this? This experience that has just devastated me. Like I could never turn this into anything other than what it is. Um, But then after more than uh, after the light we lost came out and I was sort of trying to figure out new ideas, literally every idea I came up with had a father who died. And I was like, all right, I guess I guess this is what I'm doing, because there's there's nothing I'm going to be able to write about anything else until I until I do write about this. So so he was probably right. And I shouldn't have been so livid. Um, And that so that was kind of, I think, part of it. And then another piece was that after my father passed away, I was in my mom clean out like, you know, his part of the bedroom. And I opened up the door on his uh, nightstand and inside it, I found all of these letters that he had saved that my sisters and I and my mother had written to him every single birthday, Father's Day, holiday. He had saved every single one for nearly 40 years. And 
um, as I was kind of going through them and trying to figure out, like, can I organize these chronologically? Can I organize these by person who sent it to him? Like, what should I do? I thought, what if I find a letter in here that has something in it that I didn't want to know about him? Like, what, what if that happened? And it didn't. Of course it didn't. <laughs> um, right. But... But it's such it was, a provocative question. Right. It was sort of one of these things that got stuck in my head, I think. So then when I was writing More Than Words, that's kind of what happens is Nina's father passes away and she finds all of these secrets that he'd been keeping from her for her entire life. And it kind of changes the way she feels about her childhood and her parents' marriage and herself and her future and all of that. Mm. Do you uh, obviously there's a there's a connection uh, between you and Nina in in the um, in, in the surface situation? Um, obviously, you didn't find out things like that about your dad and and didn't have those uh, kind of soul crushing questions that that come with you know your your childhood being a lie and and all that stuff. But um, it, is there a, a a connection between you and Nina as you start exploring um, kind of the the similar setting the the setup for the story? Um, well, you know, with more than words, a lot of people ask me if that's autobiographical and what I, not sorry, with more than that, more than words, with the light we lost. It's very confusing now that I have two books to yeah. talk about, right? <laughs> um, with, with the light we lost, people often ask me if it's autobiographical. And the answer that I tend to give people is that it's emotionally autobiographical, that Lucy and I are very different people. We live very different lives. But the emotions that she was feeling after um, a breakup are sort of the same ones that I was feeling that I channeled into this book. And I think a similar thing happened with more than words. You know, Nina and I are very different. Our upbringings, our personalities are pretty different. But... I think that the feelings that she has, the relationship she has with her dad and, and the devastation she feels when he's gone were very much sort of my own emotions that I kind of channeled into the story. Yeah. Um, what was the, um, uh, the motivation for setting it in New York City? Oh, I love New York City and I've lived here forever and it's just a city that I, I know so well. I felt like I could... I could write about it really well. Um, and also, you know, there's, there's the whole old New York kind of elegant money vibe. And I, I really wanted to capture that as part of Nina's life. And like it was, a, I, I could do the New York City and, you know, it's nearby and, and all of that. It's, uh, New York really kind of becomes a character, uh, in the book. It's, it, it definitely kind of, uh, exudes this, um, this kind of society and this, uh, this place that's like no other place in the world. Um, that's, uh, it's really fascinating the way you, you describe it and portray it. I mean, I think New, I mean, I, I love a lot of cities. I've, I've traveled a bunch and I think there are, there are really wonderful, incredible cities all over the world that I, you know, love to live in for a little while or visit again. But I really do think that that New York City is a really unique feeling city. And there's just so much energy and so much art and food and culture. And then also just there's like the, the grittiness of it and the smells of the pretzel guys and the chestnut guys on the street and the yellow cabs. Like, I just, I feel like there's so much about New York that is just so New York. Um, and, and it gives, it gives me a lot of energy, uh, you know, to, to sort of pull from, uh, when I'm writing or doing anything really. Well, it's, and it's those little details that really, um, help transport a reader to, um, you know, where, where uh, a story about real life that, that, you know, could happen to any one of us, uh, kind of becomes fantasy in a way where we can escape to this other world that's, you know, just up the map from us. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, you know, uh, like the light we lost, um, this book explores the complications of relationships and interpersonal, um, you know, um, workings and, and how we connect and communicate with others. Um, what are, other than the, you know, the, the initial story, um, how, how would you separate these two books in, um, in kind of how people will connect with them? Well, I feel like I feel like the light we lost is a story about love with a little bit of loss in it. And yeah. I feel like more than words is a story about loss with a little bit of love in it. But I, I think I like they're that. Thank you. I think both of them though are um really just explore what love is in all of its forms in, you know, familial love and friendship love and romantic love. And, and, and I think they're all kind of, and, and love of your city or, or, you know, your job or, or some, things like that, just kind of the different ways in which we as human beings love in our lives and what they mean to us and how they shape us. Do you think it's easier or harder uh, to write a book uh, about grief and loss as as kind of the main theme, um, you know those those emotions uh, can uh, can can really strike a chord uh, deeply with readers. And there's a um, you know there's a certain palette that you get to paint with when when dealing with those emotions that um, that are, are not available to authors who write different kinds of stories. Um, is it easier or harder to get to that emotional place to be able to tell a story like this? I mean, I think, I think I happen to be a writer who can easily access emotion. And I don't know if that's true of everyone, um, but it is true of me. And I think so much of my writing is motivated by emotion or, or you know, that's at the core of, of the stories that I tell. But I do think that the what, what's harder about writing a lot more about grief, you know, or, or writing about grief in general, is that you also don't want the book to be too sad. You don't want to sort of have your readers, you know, go down into the spiral of darkness with you. <laughs> so, so I was I was trying really hard with more than words to kind of balance the darkness with light in any way that I could so that the book itself, you know, while it's sad, isn't, isn't too sad to read, you know, isn't too hard to get through. Right. Right. And, uh, you know, in the book that, that give us that, uh, that glimpse of light and, and hope, um, are, are those things that you think about when you're writing, you know, okay, I've, I've got to let the reader off the hook just a little bit here. <laughs> um, you know, I, I've got to give them something to look forward to. Um, is that something that you're, uh, conscious of in, in the writing to to be sure to to pace the story in a way um, that we all don't just fall into despair. I think that yes, I think I do. I do. I do kind of look at pacing and look at emotional pacing as well as plot pacing to figure out like, okay, we need to take a breath here. This is getting to be a bit much. Or like, you know what? I need to maybe telescope yeah. these scenes a little bit because I've spent too much time wallowing in dark over here, and I want to get that, you know, a little tighter. Right. Um, when you're, uh, so we, we know that the, how the book begins and kind of what the, the setup is that, that brings us into Nina's journey here. Um, what does, what does this kind of story allow, um, Nina to learn uh, about herself, about her family, about what, um, you know, real love and dedication and, and all of that stuff is, um, by this uh, situation that you put her in, I, mean, I think what I think what Nina ends up learning is that you know we all go around in this world once, and that if she's going to live her life, she wants to live it as authentically as she can, and she wants to be her honest self and not hide pieces of her from the people she loves or feel like she has to hide pieces of her for people to love her. Um, and I think she, she kind of ends up putting herself out there and saying like, this is who I am and I'm going to be who I am and, and do what strikes me as important. 
and hope that the people around me will love me for, for me and not for who they want me to be. Right. Um, how have you, um, how have you seen your writing process change, uh, from, from writing kids fiction, uh, to writing adult fiction to now, uh, you know, your, your second book is, is being published now. Um, have you changed it, the work, uh, in the way that you approach it? So with children's books, I, I was a very, very intricate outliner because I felt like the books were short and they had to be really tight and I didn't have extra space in there to kind of meander. Right. So I would do a chapter by chapter outline of the whole book before I wrote it. And the outlining took almost as long as the actual writing because I was, I was really just giving myself a roadmap so that when I sat down to write, I knew exactly what had to happen in each scene in each, in each story. With The Light We Lost, I didn't know I was writing a novel. I was just kind of writing for myself, really. And I was writing these vignettes that then kind of became a novel. So I didn't really plot that much out, though Though there was a point where I was like, all right, if this is going to be a novel, I need to know where the story's going. I need to know what everyone is going to do and how they're going to end up. Um, but it was a much sort of freer process. And then for more than words, since I knew I was writing a novel and somebody, you know, was paying me to do it and have it done, (laughs) I was like, all right, let's see kind of if I can outline a little bit, kind of figure out what's going on here before I sit down to write it. Um, And I did that, but it ended up changing a whole bunch uh, from the part that I outlined, I think, because I was... I was giving myself freedom to develop the characters and have the characters go where the story felt like it would take them. And that wasn't always where I initially thought it was going to be. Does, does having that roadmap um, uh, when writing adult fiction, um, even though you, you strayed from it and uh, you know, you gave the characters the the freedom in the room to, to breathe and to mature and and do whatever it is that they're going to do. Did having that roadmap, help you um you know just just your sanity when you sit down to write okay now i know what needs to happen in this book um you know instead of just sitting down and going i have no idea what's going on today yeah i think it did it gave me a direction to go in yeah which i think was helpful to sort of say like all right i'm aiming for this point i'm aiming for this to happen so let's sort of write in that direction and see where we go you know, it's sort of like without you might not map out how you're going to get there. But if I'm like, all right, I need to go west, I can find some roads that go west and then let's figure it out from there. <laughs> right. I ultimately want to be in Wyoming. Now, right. if I go through, you know, St. Louis or Dallas, I, I'm, I can still get there. But exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, gotcha. Gotcha. Um Jill, the the book is fantastic. Um, I think everyone should pick up, um, you know, more than words and the light we lost. And I'm going to put oh, a link you. to our, I'm going to put a link to our previous interview in the show notes so people can catch up and then uh, follow up with this one as well. Um, what do you hope uh, as the writer that that when people close uh, this book, more than words, when they're finished with it, what do you mm-hmm. think they're what do you, what do you hope they're left with? I hope they're left with the idea of of life being finite so making every moment and every choice count in any way that you can that's fantastic um the book is more than words it's available everywhere now uh jill where can people find you online if they want to connect with you and learn more about you and all of that good stuff so um, I'm on Twitter at Jill Santapolo. I am on Instagram at Jill Santapolo. I'm on Facebook at slash Jill Santapolo author. And I have a website, JillSantapolo.com. Um, for the most content, I would say I'm on Instagram the most often. So that if you're looking for one place, that would be the best one to find me. 
Excellent. We're going to put links to all of it in the show notes. Uh, Jill, it's always a blast talking to you. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us and uh, good luck with uh, more than words. Thank you so much. It was great talking to you again. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. Find all the archives at hankgarner.com. Now, stay tuned for a special audiobook clip from Richard Glebe's The Jason Crane Series. On Walpurgis night, when the moon is high, hell's bells ring and witches must answer. They dapple their breasts with rendered fat of murdered babes, straddle their brooms and take to the sky, as the devil wills, to speed through dreamy midnight air to the summit of the Brockenberg, that haunted peak shrouded in swirling mists, where a glen of gnarled limbs and wan moonlight awaits to host their debauches and blasphemies. Now to the Brocken the witches ride, the stubble is gold and the corn is green, there shall the carnival sabbat be seen, and the devil shall come to preside. The accuser elopes from the bowels of hell, a sure-footed, goat-headed, many-horned beast with cloven hooves and a staff of bone. He perches upon the witch altar to brood in cerulean half-light, a winged silhouette with watchful red eyes. The witches gather and bow to their master, upon his charred rump give the shameful kiss, then imps beat the drum and a round dance begins. Lash yourselves into frenzy, hags. Pass the chalice of pure marrow broth. Whip the ground with your hair. Tread the sky with your feet. Dance with joined hands around Satan's cold fire. Then find out a nook of nettles and moss and lay with the rough-skinned beast of your choosing, suckling some rancid teat of desire. But hist! The cock crows. Away, away. Gather your tatters and broomsticks and wits back to your huts, to your thresholds and hearths, and become once more, at the red break of day, the furtive adder in your neighbor's garden. The ghost host of the Salem Sorcery Tour, dazzling in his steampunk Victorian morning crepe, let the spell he'd woven trail through the twilight air like a hag across the moon, then chirped, isn't that silly? And bowed, sweeping the wet grass with his satin-ribboned top hat. The tour group gave a polite round of applause. Nobody believes that stuff today, but the Puritans sure did. They took witches very seriously. If they went down in the morning and bought eggs and one was rotten, surely the devil had come in the night, gone boop, tee-hee-hee, then scampered off on his little hooves. And who's in league with the devil? Witches. We're taught that the Puritans were super nice and cute with little buckles on their hats, but it's not the case, folks. They were fanatics. Witch hunts don't happen in a healthy society. They hated kids. They hated women. They were crazy. And that craziness. He turned on the spot, casting a protective circle around the stone garden of the witch memorial. Got these people killed 